Brought to you direct from Studio 3B at Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, the American Hardwood Advisor is your source for trends, tips, and insights into how the building industry has evolved. Join me, Steve Stack, along with guest builders and industry leaders as we talk shop and go in depth on what it takes to be the best of the best. Dive into topics like architecture, industry trends, project plans, historical tools, tricks of the trade, and life's lessons from more than six decades of experience in the hardwood lumber business. Hey, hello again, everybody. Steve Stack back at Studio 3B, and uh, I've, got a, I've, got, I've got a fantastic guest for you today. Mr. Dan Rivers of uh, News Radio 570 WKBN. How right? you doing, Steve? It's Welcome. Great. Thank you. I love your home here. This is fantastic, and uh, just like a big time studio here. I love well, it. A little, a little yeah. different than yours. Not so many control boards and stuff. No, but it, no. It, it gets it done. It gets yeah. it done. Yeah, you got. And I, I like the the desk. Uh, where'd you guys find this desk? I found that up. Uh, Close to Mogador, Ohio. Yeah. Uh, nice, nice little shop. When I say up desk, there. this is a this is a real workbench here, and uh, this would be something that uh, they might have had, you know, in high school here for industrial arch or something. This this uh, is manufactured by Grand Rapids Screw Company out of mm -hmm. Grand Rapids, Michigan. Yeah. And they started with wood screw, woodworking clamps, mm -hmm. and as time evolved, they graduated into workbenches and. That is exactly what they did with them. They supplied schools, schools. and shop classes oh, with woodworking benches. And of course, these little notches here would be so that you could use clamps Those here. Those are the dog holes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are really sweet. It's but, uh, great, it's, it's great a great piece. piece. Yeah, it's a great piece. We were we were thrilled to to come across it. Yeah, I don't know where to start with you. I I guess the be best place would be. How about let tell the folks a little bit about yourself. How about in high school when I picked up a pop bottle? And I went around and I interviewed people in the hall. That's what I did. And, I can see that. And uh, I wasn't even embarrassed by it, you know. And I said, you know, hey, I'm going to be in broadcasting. Um, had a broadcaster come to my home when I was in high school and tell me about getting into it. And I never pursued that. I have a background in construction. My uncle ran um, um, a house building business and uh, we all went to work for him, my brother, myself, everybody in the family. It was just a natural thing to do when you got to be 14 years of age. And um, so kind of forgot about the broadcasting career. Um, worked for him for five years, about 20 years of age. Uh, the Vietnam War was going on. I had some carpentry skills and the Seabees, the Naval Construction Seabees, yep. they were looking for craftsmen plumbers, electricians, builders, equipment operators, and I fell under the term of builder, and I signed up, and I went into the CBs, signed a contract that they could send me to Vietnam twice, which they did, and um, but went, and it was part of the mobile construction battalion, um, about 10 months in a place called Dong Ha, which is about four or five miles from the demilitarized zone, and we built up a beautiful bridge that went across the Quaviet River. And it would be about the size of the Market Street Bridge. We went in and we drove pile, we put on cement caps, and then we set steel. And I'm kind of going fast because when we went out there and put those caps in there for the concrete, we swam day and night. And even in Vietnam, it's cold at night. And we'd be out there swimming and putting those uh, big forms together, which would have been about 40 by 40 form big of forms. platforms. And once we had those up, we uh, sealed them up as best we could. We dove and we um, pumped the water out. <laughs> and then we had the big buckets of concrete come in and we would fill up the concrete in one end of it and it would push the seawater out. You would yeah. just keep putting the yeah. concrete up on top so it wouldn't um, disintegrate. And then we'd take the forms off and eventually the steel workers came in, set the steel, and then we took um, two by 12s, turned on edge, which would be an inch and five eighths by 14, and we set those on edge and we went all the way across that river an inch and a half at a time. Hardest work I ever did, we worked 24 hours straight. What we do, we go eight hours on, go sleep eight hours, and then eight hours back. And we kept going around Just the clock until the deck was on. So 
Um, that was my construction experience in uh, Dong Ha. Came back, we rebuilt our battalion in Gulfport, Mississippi. The next time we went over, we stopped in Da Nang, and then we went down by, eventually, to Cambodia and build housing for the South Vietnamese Army. And then when, um, when that was complete, came back to the United States, and I followed up on that promise to go into broadcasting. I went to a very quick four-month school on how to become a broadcaster, and I got a job about two months into the deal. And I worked in Marysville, Delaware, Coshocton, Toledo, Detroit, Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, and finally Youngstown, Ohio, where I found out I really should go to college. <laughs> <laughs> so again, um, the American government, which I adore, they paid my way through Youngstown State. And back when I went to Youngstown State, you kids will get a kick out of this. The tuition was so inexpensive that the government actually paid me more money than the tuition was at Youngstown State. Unbelievable. And so I got a few hours here and a few hours there. And you know, when you get a couple hours, you think, I could graduate. <laughs> right. I could graduate. So I finally did that. And then um, I was working at WFMG at the time. And uh, Pete Gabriel hired me over at WKBN. And that's when my education really began in broadcasting. Now, what year was that? That had been 1980. 1980. You mentioned Pete. And I, yeah. I was yeah. trying to place... But uh, yeah, I um, <clears throat> went to work for Pete. Uh, short, I was going to school part-time while I was still working for Pete. And then I, I, the Williamsons at WKBN, they believed in education, in educating their um, employees. And I learned a lot and learned the, learned the broadcasting career, eventually became the operations manager. And now I've gone back the other way. It's a perfect career because I was the operations manager with all the responsibility. And now when all the computer stuff comes in where you have to do reports and stuff like that, I went back to being an air talent. <laughs> right, right. So I don't have to do those reports. <laughs> so that worked out pretty good. So that's kind of how I got here. And um, I'm a big supporter of Youngstown State and this valley. And of course, Beard Brothers Fine Hardwoods, which I, I love what you guys do. Love working, walking through your warehouse. And the amount of product that you create every day is amazing, isn't it? <clears throat> it is, it is. And thank, thank you for those words. Um, do you still partake in any woodworking projects? I do, and um, whenever I have an opportunity to do something around the house. Um, but uh, sometimes I'll call somebody to hang a door once in a while now, you know, and said, yeah. and said you know what, maybe they would like to do this. But uh, the last project I did, I did the, um, the tongue and groove flooring in the basement. And uh, what do they call that? Luxury vinyl. Right, right. And um, the learning curve is for fairly high. I don't know if you've done it or not, mm -hmm. but... The more expensive pieces you get, the easier it is to do because you don't break them as easily. But um, I, I worked my way six inches across that basement uh, and uh, in three or four weeks I had it done. So that was a good project. That's, uh, <clears throat> that's good and, and we, we find in, in, in talking to different folks we have in, there's something about it and from building bridges in Vietnam yep. to doing a project at home uh, I'm sure the project at home is is much closer to what how I want to relate it. You get caught up in a project, yeah, and you find yourself relaxing in doing what you're doing, whether it be building a cabinet, hanging a door. Sometimes you forget how much you're enjoying the act of doing something because a lot of people think, "Wow, I just got to get to the end of this." You have to enjoy the time, yeah. right? Enjoy the ride. That's, that's it, and, and I, I, I know myself, I'm guilty of that. You just get engulfed with what you're doing, yeah. but at the end of the day, you can look back and see what you accomplished. Yeah. You know, and, and I think when you own a house, I think you do something to it every year to try to improve it. Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny, on Saturday, um, I must not have had much to do because I was out, I was improving the curbs in front of the house, you know, where you might have a front land loader on there, make a chip in there. And I said, you know what, let's put that concrete back the way it was supposed to be, you know? And I think you always have to be aware that you're trying to make it better than if you, if you just, if you just move into a house and let it stand, nothing good's going to happen. No, oh, that's it. That's it. And you, you, it's yearly maintenance. Yeah. It's, it, it's a continuous thing. And uh, it, but, it's good stuff though, you know, and, and uh, we, we like that mentality, that mm -hmm. philosophy, 
because part of our audience are DIY homeowners. Yep. And as long as they're doing projects, they're coming out to Baird Brothers for some of that quality hardwood we manufacture. And you know you can learn just about anything with all the video available these days. And of course with your wonderful channel now, you can see projects actually take place. And it's, it's just a wonderful, and, and a, some of it goes back to industrial arts in high school. You know, I uh, built that picnic table for my mother. I built that um, corner cabinet for my mother. Um, not a very well planned project, but uh, we got it done. And just, and, and my brother does that type of stuff too. And he loves working in the woodworking business. I particularly love talking construction. So I'm on a radio program the other day and I'm saying, you know, one of my first jobs, my uncle was running a backhoe and I was in the, in the, in the ditch or in the footer, we're digging the footer. And my job was whatever the backhoe didn't get, crumb that out and throw it, throw it off and then put up the stick and then someone on the transit would read and they would go two inches down, one inch up. And I was saying that was my, jumping in and out of holes, that was my first job. So his son called me and he said, hey, I'm running a backhoe today. And he said, we don't need anybody in the hole. In fact, we don't need a transit. We have a laser on the excavator now. <laughs> he said, don't discourage people from, from the way it used to be. Well, you touched on it. We have a, a, a generation of kids that never had the opportunity to go through what you and I did yep. as uh, in the industrial arts class. I, I know when, when we went through it in school, I went through it in school, you learned woodworking, you learned a little bit of metal working, mm -hmm. you know, as far yeah, well, as where welding. Would you learn, where would you learn to smoke when, when, while you're welding? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Remember that? The shop had that back door that the guy snuck out. Yeah. <laughs> you're welding, you're putting all this in. I have a cigarette here. But, you know, in, in all seriousness, it created a lack of uh, skilled employees. We're, mm -hmm. we're witnessing it today. Yeah, you're right. I mean, and uh, although um, I think sometimes millennials will surprise you by taking on a project that they have seen on video. My son is an example. Uh, he lives in Columbus, but uh, not a lot of projects he won't tackle, and he didn't really grow up with that skill. And that goes, and that goes back to what you say is available socially yeah. on all the different platforms. Yep. Uh, I'm not good with a wrench per se, mm -hmm. but if I need to change an electric motor in my driver's door for my power window, I can pull it up online yep. and it'll walk you through the steps. You know? uh, and, but I, I know that the state has made a, an effort the last few years in getting people back into trade schools. Yep. Some of the new schools, they have a smaller, more limited industrial arts class, right, right. but it's getting reintroduced. Yeah. You know, we have the vocational school around the corner from us here. They had a great place. Fantastic. I get a great story from them. I was out there and I was uh, at Governor DeWine's cabinet meeting. He, in he invited me out to witness the cabinet meeting. He had all of his cabinet out there. And I walk into the school and here's these young men and they're sitting there and they had brought in their fast food. They're sitting at a table. They're looking at books. They're drinking their coffee. They're adults already. And they're being treated like adults at the uh, Canfield Joint Vocational School uh, Career and Technical Center, I should say. Right, yeah. yeah. So I, I love what they've done out there because they're telling these kids, we don't have to keep an eye on you. You know what to do. Confidence. Yeah. Self-confidence. Yeah. And, and that's something you know. You've, you, we have to generate it in the kids. Yeah. Uh, not, not everybody's uh, set up to believe in themselves enough. And, and another, another good story, the folks here, I, think I saw in the business journal the other day, where they had just mentioned a kid that was being hired by one of the marketing companies and being promoted. And this young man said, I got my instruction at the Career and Technical Center in Canfield. And think about that. He's graduated from high school and then goes out and can work as a skill already. Whether you stay with that or nothing or not, you've got that one. Right. You know, and, and uh, uh, to, your, to your nephew's uh, example, as far as not needing the guy down in the trench anymore with the technology yep. involved, uh, some of these kids can kill it in a trade school job. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, 
throughout the building industry, electric has changed, uh, installation, plumbing. Mm -hmm. It's different than it was. Carpentry, the introduction of pneumatic hammers mm -hmm. and the saws and every, everything has changed. It's still labor, but it, it, it's a little easier than it was. I've learned all I know about uh, modern day carpentry from Tommy Silva on this old house. I'm a fan of that show. There's one of our partners. Yeah, There's one of our partners. Great partner. Uh, and, and you know, um, the man has so much confidence and uh, just not too much you're going to get by him. We just finished a project with uh, Tommy's nephew, Charlie. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're right, the, the piece that, uh, that Tommy does with this old house, uh, great information, great information. He's got, uh, he has a video out right now uh, in his library of building a screen door. Yeah. Right? Uh, why would I ever have to do that? Well, if I have an older home, guess what? They don't make a screen door today to fit that old door style, you right. know, 42 inches wide, yeah. 83 inches tall. Where do you find it? Yeah. You don't. You make it. You can go see how to do that. I can see how you could build that project, yeah. I mean, you just yeah. put, visualize it, yeah. And, and you know, he takes, he, he takes you through it, so oh, that's good kind of, kind of interesting. I've never been on this end of it or very much where people are interviewing me, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, I know I tend to be verbose, but uh, I... I, I love what you've, you're doing here. You're talking to people from all walks of life. All walks of life, uh, all the different job sets from contractors to uh, homeowners to makers to our, our buddy, the antique uh, woodworking yep. tool historian. And, and that's why we set it up, Dan, and folks like yourself who are great partners of ours down over at 570 KBN. And, and it's, it's information. Uh, whether it be educational, informational, or how-to. Um, we want to have folks in, and we, we want to have fun doing it, and we want to transvey some information that some of our audience is going to find useful. Yeah. And, and uh, <clears throat> in your case, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tap you on this, uh, you're, you know, you're one of the cornerstones of the Mahoning Valley in radio. And... I have to ask you, because I, I go back to the day down at YSU, you mentioned YSU. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be running a little bit late, and all, at that time the decks would be full, and I'd end up in an outside lot. I'd go to classes for the day, I'd come back out, and my car had that beautiful rust-hewn coating on top mm -hmm. of it. And that was the days when the mills were still running. And yeah, that was considered acceptable, very yeah. acceptable. <laughs> right? That was a good thing. Yeah. That meant guys were working. But that's where I wanted to hit you up. You've seen so many changes in the Mahoning Valley. Yeah. Any pop in your head that st stick out to you? Yeah, you know, I really think that um, the biggest change um, was a guy named Artis Gillum. And he was the president of city council. George McKelvey was the mayor. And we had received $29 million to put together the Cavalli Center, which was then called the Chevrolet Center. And we argued for four years as to how we were going to build this because we were 10 million short. And it went back and forth and I agitated every day for it. I said, you know, we've got to get this built. And finally I met this guy named Artis Gillum and he says, I'm going to Hildago. And he went to Hildago, Texas, where a company called Global had built a similar center. And he came back and he said, we can do this and Global will do this. And George McKelvey put together a plan for the $10 million, but it was really a plan where they were just borrowing $10 million, which they're finally just retiring the debt. But my philosophy was build this because so many people said, well, let's restore the West End. Let's put it in Beagley. Let's do this, let's do that. There's nothing that has been more of a catalyst for change than the Cavelli Center. It was once you build something, You've got that. And then you put it into the hands of Youngstown City. They've done a pretty good job of making that go. First, they're smart enough to hire an experienced guy like Eric Ryan. There you go. Um, and they're allow allowing him to run with the ball. And we have brought in so many people. You imagine Carrie Underwood coming into our town. That gets the attention of people from all over. I've seen Rod Stewart, I've seen Lionel Richie. And that gets the attention. Pound for pound, we have become more entertainment friendly than any zip code in the nation. 
<clears throat> the Cavelli Center was the nucleus of the spinoff right next door to it to the outdoor park, the yeah. amphitheater park. Right, and the, they came up with the idea of the amphitheater. In fact, if you go downtown now, if you ever do visit our city, if you'll st start at the um, north end of Phelps Street and walk up and you come up and there's a restaurant on the left, there's V-squared on the right, there's the whistling keg on the back, and now Phelps will go down and it feeds directly into the amphitheater. Yeah. So it's one big long, and it's a beautiful look. I know everybody's struggling a little bit right now, but again, it's something that we have for better times to come. You don't, you don't typically see it in the size of a town of Youngstown. You see entertainment districts in larger cities, yeah. but here we are, little Youngstown, Ohio, and it really has come into its own the last couple of years. Well, and, and you think if it would have been an 18,000 uh, seat arena, it would have been too big because we just don't have the population. When I started here, we were about 800,000. We're probably somewhere in the five county area around 700,000 now. Right. So, but it still opens up those markets in Akron, Canton, Cleveland. And I like to be the ambassador for the town because I don't think that you can minimize the availability to be able to go downtown and see Rod Stewart, or to see, yeah. um, we, we just had the Os uh, Brothers Osborne here. So yeah. that's cool, and then it's spun off into Warren now because Packard is being utilized, the Robbins Theater. So we're kind of building this area on entertainment, and I think that's huge. So, <clears throat> so you used a word a few minutes ago when you were, uh, when you were on board with the Cavelli Center being, being started, being built, yeah. and you, you said you went to your audience every day and weekly and you agitated. I did, I so did. So sometimes you play the devil's advocate on the radio. Actually, it wasn't even the devil's advocate. I'm saying, are you that stupid that you're not gonna take $29 million and build the center that Jim Traffickant put his uh, entire career on hold for? He went back and you, know, you gotta admit that uh, Jim Traffickant saying, I need $29 million for a family center. It was kind of stretching the truth. What we were looking for was an arena, and we didn't have one. Right. And it's got to be one of the more successful things ever done here because there are places our size that don't have those arenas, right. and we have one. And you know, not everything's a hit, but for the most part, it's really been good for the Valley. It's nice having a little sunshine bear down on you rather than walking around with a black eye. Well, and then Youngstown State University is um, probably the most important entity that we have in this valley simply because we have a great university. Uh, we have great sports teams, and, you know, of course, we could always be a little bit better, but Youngstown State University still stands for affordable education. Academia is academia, right? Right. You can get it at Youngstown State. Go on to a selective um, postgraduate degree if you want. Right. No, no. And, and the university, uh, we're aware of it, how it spills into downtown yeah. more and more every day. And, and One thing that we have a huge issue here, and that's with the crime, and the crime is threatening to swallow us right now, undo all the good that we've done. And I have been agitating again in saying we need to hire more detectives because the only way you fix the crime problem in the long run is to actually arrest people and incarcerate them. Because we have um, a wonderful system set up, but there's too many people on the streets that are gonna keep people from going downtown, keep people from enjoying themselves. And every, every city faces that, but yep. uh, like you're saying and, and what I'm hearing, now's an opportune time to, to nip it in the bud. Be, be proactive, get it, get it turned down. And nothing else works because you can go out and you can flood the zone with police and everything like that, but the propensity to, to be able to time when somebody's gonna commit a crime, you have no idea, you have to be lucky. So these people um, that are going to be bad actors, they can't live among us. It's called society. Yeah, you gotta, <laughs> they gotta be off. Right, right. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's important, that really is. I got a quick story. Um, we have uh, been the beneficiary of a lot of um, entertainment and Jay Leno has played the Valley twice in the last five years and he's come into the studio both times that he's come into town and that is something that I consider a real privilege that people would pick out 570 WKBN and say 
we want to come in and sit down and we want to promote the show. Walks in, work shirt, regular guy. Um, so those are the kind of things, you know, we, that we kind of the back scene of things. I remember I was introducing him at Stambul Auditorium, have a chance to sit backstage and talk to him 20 minutes before he goes on. Truly an art on what they can do. Make you laugh continuously for an hour and a half. Right? That's, yeah. That's a craft. Yes. That's a craft, a different craft. Yeah. But, uh, and, and, and the same thing, and, and you, you say that, and I'm, I'm thinking, wow, Steve, if you'd asked yourself that question, what would the answer be? And I, I have to reflect back a few years ago that we hosted some of the cast and crew from this old house out here at Baird Brothers. And you know what? Like, like you say, we have a national show yeah. that picked out this little town in Mahoning County mm -hmm. and they spent a day here yeah. and, and it, it, it was fun and it was like... I always get a big thrill. I just call my wife and I say, hey, see, they said uh, uh, some of the products on this show were supplied by Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods. Yeah. And I know you've, you've talked to, I mean, you, you know I'm a, a viewer of that show and all of the folks on there from Kevin, I think you've gotten to know him very well. Yeah. And Tommy, Master Plumbers, and I um, mean, and you know, just a great thing. And then Baird Brothers, you have something that I'm going to say it's fairly unique to the United States. There may be other people that do what you do, but regionally, don't you guys ship to almost every state? All 50, all yeah. 50, and uh, uh, a little bit into Canada. But uh, yeah, one thing unique to, to Baird Brothers. When I hired back in here a number of years ago, it was instilled in me the quality of the product that goes out the front door or out the gate or out of package. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and that hasn't changed. The craftsmanship, the quality, you've, you've gone through the shop. And, and I, I, tell, I tell folks as I'm taking them around on the nickel tour, I say, you see all the, the, this new fancy equipment. You know, We have an MRI for wood. We have a CNC aided equipment. And the two most important pieces of equipment we have out in that shop are still the human eyes and the human hands. Yeah. And you the knowledge. You have a lot of people out there. I walked through the shop today. Yeah. Great. You know, in, as far as, um, boy, timing couldn't be better. One of the greenest companies you're ever going to find. And, you know, if you think about this and you're listening to us for the first time, I mean, you've got a company that they take a scrap piece of lumber, they finger joint it, put it together, and it, they can paint it. And it looks like just a, a, a it's nothing wasted. The sawdust, they sell it to farmers for bedding or they'll burn it right. uh, for, for fuel, fuel and heat. Fuel yep. um, it, it Really, the most basic way of in protecting the environment. Uh, the smallest footprint. Yeah that we can possibly leave behind. And that, that was the approach and in, in, uh, the initiative of the first generation of, of the Baird brothers, Howard, Richard, and, and uh, Paul. And that hasn't changed either. The, you know, they're, they're, they're very big on reinvesting. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, ever since 1976, when I started hanging around here, they've always, just like our homes, they've always put back into the property, yeah, you know, the reinvestment. Uh, I think we both had the fortune to work for people like that. Uh, I've worked for cur currently for iHeart, which has been purchased, but originally it was the Williamsons, the people that were the pioneers in broadcasting here. And they always invested in equipment and people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's huge. Very much so. So full circle, we, yeah. have, we have great uh, partners, affiliations with uh, many people here in the Valley, uh, 570 KBN, yourself, uh, and on the national scale, uh, this old house, uh, we're starting a new relationship uh, with the Outdoor Channel, a uh, new program called Renovation Hunters, and uh, we're through with one project. We have another project coming up next week, and then a follow-up project in July. Uh, going back to advertising, I almost hate to call it advertising. Mm -hmm. I think of it more as relationship building. Yeah. Whether it be your voice talking about Baird Brothers on the radio, whether folks are turning on the This Old House channel, the Outdoor channel, uh, whether they're seeing it in print, it's important. We have about five different audience groups that we consider 
are different avenues of yeah. communication, right? right? Uh, and, and so we try to mask that with specialty information for each one of those groups. And uh, I know with you, we've, we've started a practice where every once in a while we flip you some of the current topics yeah. and subjects and things that are going on out here at Baird Brothers. Mm -hmm. And because of our confidence in you, we leave you run with it. Yeah. And you do a beautiful job. And, and thank you for that. Uh, but you deal with a lot of different companies that you represent yeah. Yeah. on the airwaves. Well, you know, one of the things about um, <clears throat> talk radio is that I don't consider um, commercials um, an, an evil because a lot of times they're information that I can pass on to you whether it's passing on something for gutter repair, or if it's passing on somebody that's uh, maybe mitigating radon, or, you know, these are things they need, and, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, when you guys have Red, White, and True, it's uh, something that right. I, I loved uh, doing, and you guys come out and you, you, you introduce the valley to your product, and I kind of weave the, you know, a select group of companies into my advertising and I don't really consider it advertising it's really giving people information that they may not have yeah very you know? very and, true very and, true um, sometimes there are a lot of commercials and some of them can beat you over the head with them but uh, a lot of the advertising too is um, informational you know if you take an entire entire hour you know we have five minutes to the top of the hour for the news and then we have uh, maybe four minutes of commercials and maybe half an hour or at the half hour we have another three or four minutes of news but it's all content, and if it's done right, it's content people want. Right, and uh, that's kind of kind of how I look at it. Informational, so it's a it's a labor of love talking about your company, and I've known you guys for since I go I go way back with the Baird Brothers. Yeah, and 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 there again, it's it's a trusted partnership. Yeah, you know our our respect and trust of you, having the knowledge of our company. Uh, a lot we share a lot of the same principles a lot of the same philosophies so it's easy to say okay dan here here's what's going on at baird brothers 7060 yeah. quarry road right yeah. now uh have fun with it yeah well you know the I, live reads the live reads are, are yeah i appreciate that they're, they're 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 legit right yeah i appreciate that i grew up um, near finley um finley lima ottawa over in columbus grove ohio and when i became a member of this valley. I don't know if it's because the steel mills were down and because we went on such hard times, but one of the things that I love to do is fight back for this valley. And I look at these iconic companies, Youngstown State, St. Elizabeth's Hospital, Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, and you can go down and tick all these off, these assets that we have, and I think you have to be able, and you gotta be careful that you're not too blue sky because there's a lot of negative news too. Right. But on the other hand, you have to be looking forward, what can we do? And that's what you guys are doing with Baird Brothers, right? With your national footprint now. Well, well that's it. And, and you know, the Baird families, are, they're very proud of, of what we have here out in Canfield. And they've busted their butts to get it. Yep. Right? Um, and so now, you know, we've more family, more employees. Uh, you build the monster, you, you're feeding it. Mm -hmm. and, and we like to be proactive in, you know, this isn't a bad thing. This is a fantastic thing yep. that's been created. You've created it kind of like what we've done with uh, 570 WKBN. And uh, at 570 WKBN, if you went back to about 1979 or 1980, we were playing music. Well, the writing was on the wall that you wouldn't be playing music on the AM dial. And so Pete Gabriel's able to hire Dan Ryan and then Ron Verb and Tony Rose and myself. Um, and what we have, and I fight every day to hold on to it, is that we have live talk here locally. Because so many talk shows, are, so many stations are syndicated now, but I remind my listeners every day, you can call me between the hours of nine and noon, and if you use good language, you can say almost anything you want political, um, controversial, whatever, as long as you do it with responsibility. And that's something that we have in this valley in the form of 570, you know, we're down 570 on the dial, it goes all over. My mother would listen to me 200 miles away. Yeah. You just hit 
a series of names there that are considered different cornerstones of the community. Right. I mean, really. And, and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking and uh, thinking to myself and I'm thinking, man, if I want to know what's going on in the Moaning Valley, I got to talk to the guy that has his hand on the pulse of the valley every single day he goes in front of the radio yeah. mic. You know, you miss some things out there because of the federal government and uh, the Biden administration has been so controversy, controversial with all of the immigration, with the high gas prices and stuff like that. So we do miss some things locally sometimes, but it seems like all of those things are pushed out of the way with $5 gasoline. You know, and basically, folks, this country is turning on diesel fuel. $6 a gallon, it's affecting Baird Brothers, it's affecting everybody. The food that you get, your eggs, all of this stuff. We have gone way too fast. Electric is going to become an evolution, not a revolution. Allow it to come on slowly. Slowly. We, we experience it here. Change is difficult, yep. whether it be a new piece of equipment, yeah. new personnel, but you give it a chance. Yeah. Uh, we might be 20, 30, 40 years away, but we have these fuel sources yep. that have gotten us to this point. Yep. Right, and, and we are so clean right now because the natural gas has been a godsend here in Ohio, and it burns a lot cleaner than uh, diesel or a lot than, than fuel oil. So we've cleaned the environment up. Other people around the world are not doing that. We're doing more here. So let it, business will figure it out. In fact, business will figure out how many charging stations we need. Yeah. Don't go put a bunch of charging stations in here. Put them in as needed. Put no, them in as needed. Uh, very, very much so. And, and like you said, uh, uh, the subject matter is in my little town I drove through this morning. It's 5079, right? Yep. That's well and fine right now. No, it isn't. But I, I'm saying in the, in the sense that the economic spinoff, the cost to the consumer whether it be the eggs or mm -hmm. whether you're, you're getting the, the Scott towels or paper towels, it's going to be reflected in everything. It, everything that's brought to you by truck and most things are. I mean, it, it's costing you more money. And um, I'm a big fan of electric. I, I love uh, the, I've, I've ridden in the Teslas, even considered getting one. Uh, but I realize these tin horn Congress people out there like Debbie Stebenow, who says, I drove from Michigan to uh, California and I went right on by the gas stations and I didn't have to worry about the price of gasoline. And I thought, you have got a tin ear because most of us are still filling up with gasoline. Oh, very much so. You know, very much so. Don't give me that arrogance. You need to take care of your people. Until we get to that point, we live over top of some of the largest natural resource. Right available anywhere yeah. in the world yeah we split it we crack it we uh um you know monaca pennsylvania oh i mean gosh. i mean the the project they have going on over there they obviously think that plastic is going to be around for a while because they're making all these pellets right. there's also some really neat revelations going on in the youngstown area uh, a company called sobe um, they want to they want to bring tires into lowellville grind the tires up and seven different types of plastic separate the carbon and the steel, sell that off, bring it down to Youngstown, put it in an enclosed vat, heat it, and it puts off a synthetic natural gas to heat the city. That's the project they've got going. That's being pioneered right here in Youngstown. So, so we went from when you and I, when, when you and I were introduced to Youngstown, uh, me being from the Mahoning Valley all my life, and, and my steel mill comment about yeah. attending YSU and, and uh, the so-called Rust Belt, right? right? Uh, to you look around today, some of the technology that's being dumped into this valley, it's amazing. Yeah. You mentioned Lordstown. Yeah. The beautiful distribution center up there. Yeah. Okay. That goes right back to our fuel conversation, unfortunately. But uh, how many trucks are coming in and out of there every day? Yeah. And I see small things like these are small, like Myers. We thought, well, are we ever going to get a Myers here? Now we're going to get three of them. So it means it gives you confidence that we can do things here, that people do look at this market as important. Um, with Ultium Cells, what they're doing up there is amazing. This shop at uh, Ultium Cells 
is going to be completely hands-free. There's going to be people here running a PC. It will manufacture, it will package, and ship without anybody touching it. Have you, have you been had a I chance to tour that? No? I, I, I know just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Ultium cells. And then if we would all, uh, and the other thing too, uh, one thing that we've got coming in here is the pair. They're going to make 250,000 units of this $29,000 car. That's how uh, Fisker is going to build that car. Uh, we have the Endurance, which um, has had some ups and downs. Maybe it will succeed, but they're sure giving it a good shot. Um, Valoric has been an outstanding partner for yes. our valley. Yeah. The one thing they all have in common, they're all looking for people. <laughs> How are they going to do it? Um, somebody told me the only way you do it is pay them. The, the, yeah. the guy told me, in fact, he runs a small shop in um, Columbiana, and he says, I wasn't able to really solve my problem until I decided I've really got, I've got to pay people to work. And, yeah. And, and we've seen a lot of that coming yeah. out of the pandemic. And, yeah. and uh, we say over here at Baird's, you know, the guys from the front all the way to the back of the facility, every one of them is important. Mm -hmm. and, and it takes different skill sets. It yep. uh, takes the right mindset, though, that I, gotta, I, I, I don't got to. I want to get up and go to work in the morning. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, again, that's something that is taught. Yeah. I mean, and I see a lot of people around here, and it takes a lot of material handling. And every day, you're, guys, you're putting out more product, and I can only imagine your shipping department. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and perfect example. Those guys have nothing to do with the manufacturing process, but those guys are the last one laying their eyes and their hands on that product right, right. before it gets packaged up and sent anywhere across the United States. Which is only good business because returns are expensive. It, returns are expensive, and our customers, their expectation level yeah. is up here somewhere. Yeah, and and we have to strive to meet that. Yeah, you know, pretty interesting uh, format you have here. You know, you're you're able to reach a lot of people on video, and uh, I've kind of used a little bit of my program now. You know, using uh, some video, but uh, still, the the basics of our programming is still the same as it was. Years and years ago. Isn't that amazing? I mean, radio, if it was to be invented now, people would think, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> but it seems to have endured, uh, and we continue to get people that listen to us and depend on us. And I think it's the immediacy. You can still call me, and you can talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. If, if you don't have anybody else to talk about, talk to, you can talk to me. That, that was true. Uh, you used the word immediacy. And, and I go back uh, to that fateful day. Uh, I remember exactly where I was at. I'm uh, driving up Route 44 out of, uh, out of Ravenna, heading, heading up north for the day. And I just made it to 303, or probably just Route 303. And I was going through the radio in, that, in, in my van that I was driving, and I come across Howie Chizzy. And, he was announcing what had been taking place not four minutes ago, you know, before it hit the TV. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I remember that day I pulled over, there was a state highway patrolman sitting alongside the road. And I pulled up behind him, got out, got out of my vehicle, I walked up, I said, what's going on, officer? He says, it just came across my radio too, son. He says, you might want to be going home. <laughs> and, but the, imme the immediacy of it. Mm -hmm. I go back. We use, and, and we're fortunate. For you, for the World Trade Center. Yeah, the World Trade Center is nine one one, and and uh, but we use all avenues, print, radio, TV. Yeah. Uh, and and I always I always say that I go to a job site. Don't matter what time of day it is, you're going to find two things. You're going to find radios playing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And at lunch break, you're probably going to see a couple guys reading a newspaper. Yeah. You're not going to see a TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, and that, and that, you know, we'll go back to transitioning from fossil fuels to electric. Yeah. All right. Same thing with media, newspaper, radio, yeah. right? And now we all have these devices in right, our pockets right, right. that 
you want to watch the new news? <laughs> you can watch you the can new watch news, it, yeah. you know, yeah. but it, it's a transition. Yeah. It's a transition. Yeah, radio is interesting in the, from this viewpoint in that um, people build relationships with the people that are behind it. And um, I like to be, you know, the only thing you have is your reputation. And uh, I don't want to advertise any products that I don't believe in. And you're able to give people good information. That's a little bit hard to attain in other medium because me radio is so personal. It's my own, my experience. And not every commercial is an endorsement, but I know when I speak for the Baird Brothers, I mean, I, I, I know that I'm very happy to be doing that. It's just a, a good company. And, and thank you again. And, and why, why is there that relationship? You've, you've used our product. You've taken the time to come out and you, experience. You have to immerse yourself in it. You, right. know, you can't be superficial. You've got to go back and you've got to take the tour. You've got to go to Red, White and True. You've got to walk through and talk to the people that are handling the material. And you have to learn about the finger joining, and you have to learn about the products they have, and uh, and then their and your website. You reach so many people. Websites are so nice, so now, and the, the way you can change them so quickly. It's another tool, yeah. uh, not only for our salespeople but for our consumers. So where's lumber prices going? Uh, we've got a couple couple species that are still pretty hot. Uh, white oak has been on fire for the last three years in popularity, and okay. and. Uh, but that is uh it's it's not a gouging situation it's strictly a supply and demand mm -hmm. issue and red oak is plentiful is that right red oak red oak is is good right now red oak is one of the best values going here at baird brothers uh, and uh, our poplar uh, somewhat caused from the pandemic and and lack of international shipping and that whole mm -hmm. scenario uh, the mdf is uh, uh, used as a very economical product for interior moldings because of the lack of availability there was a lot of pressure put on our you mentioned our poplar primed finger yep. jointed line yep. um, so it, it it did a little bit of rise but in our product unlike the construction grade uh, products the two by fours the two by tens uh, yep. the plywood yep. Uh, where they saw, you know, 100, 150% increase, 200% increase. Yeah. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we get a little nervous when we have to introduce a 10, 15% increase. <laughs> and we've had to do that a exactly. couple of times, but, but nothing in comparison to the other side of the, the wood markets. You know, you and I have something in common that um, my wife likes to garden and you like to garden. <laughs> See, I, you notice I didn't say anything, but um, it's so funny, a li, you know, just to show you how big our family is on the radio. I'm saying, you know what, every, way, every year the deer come in and they mow my wife's garden down and she says, I'm not putting a garden in next year. And then in May she does. And a guy calls me up and he said, hey, he says, you know what? He says, I grow 20 foot tall sunflowers. And he, how I do it? He said, I put WKBN on in the garden at about eight o'clock at night. <laughs> And I let it run all night. And he said, the deer, they don't bother my garden at all. <laughs> so if it works, folks, try it. Try it, right? Oh, that's, that's fun. That's fun. Well, we've covered a little bit of territory. Summer's going to be a little more normal, we I'm, I'm thinking. We didn't talk about golf. Uh, let's not talk about golf. Golf, golf. That's my, that's my passion. I love it. I love it. Uh, if, I'm not, if I'm not practicing it, I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Right? Yep. Right? Just a, just there you never really get to the point where you're proficient. In fact, I talked to a pro one day and I said, I said, "Do you still enjoy playing golf when you when you're so good at it?" And, "Oh, yeah, yeah." But I'm just thinking if if you ever really climbed that mountain, maybe you wouldn't play as much. See, I I've, I've got I've got a couple good uh good golf days coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, because the weather is going to represent my golf game. It's going to be in the upper 90s, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, we're, we're, we're covered. we got a couple opportunities coming up the next yeah. few days. Yeah. Hey, my friend. My pleasure. Thanks for coming in. Thank uh, you. Everybody, tune into this guy. 9 a.m. 9 a.m. till Mon noon. Monday through Friday, all across the country on iHeartRadio. And on um, 570 KBN. And Facebook Live and 570 WKBN. Yep. And every show's podcast, too, just there, like yours. There you go, right? Yep. So, folks.
pay attention, follow this guy. A lot of good conversation taking place on the radio, nine to noon. And and uh, we really appreciate you having a uh, such a pleasure having to, a partner, uh, man. Such a pleasure to allow me to bloviate about myself. I appreciate. it. Hope we didn't bore you too much. Well, you know what? There's going to be more guys like this and some other great stuff coming up on the social, folks. Stay tuned. Follow us across the board: Facebook, Instagram, BairdBrothers.com, and have a great day. For all you folks listening, thanks for talking shop with Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods. If you've enjoyed this episode and want to stay up to date with the American Hardwood Advisor Series, give us a like and subscribe. For more tips, projects, and inspiration, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or at BairdBrothers.com. Until next time, 